Good morning. It is so good to be here once again. And it's kind of hard to believe that it's been a year since uh, my family has been part of this congregation. And we have truly, truly loved it. Uh, it has been um, so wonderful to be welcomed into this family, and we feel like we've always felt a part of this family, and we're looking forward to uh, the years ahead with you and growing with you and learning with you. So thank you uh, for the warm reception you've already given us and the encouragement we've had uh, the past year. Uh, I'm so grateful that I have the opportunity to, to speak to you this morning. Uh, I hope this lesson will be a sense of encouragement for you, and, and stir those wheels in your head as you think about God's Word uh, this morning. Uh, the title for my lesson is called Things We Should Hear and Say. And just in a few moments, we're going to dive into Second Chronicles on a story that maybe you haven't heard of. And I want to challenge you to think about uh, the words of advice that maybe you receive from others and the words that you say. Um, two weeks ago, uh, we, the youth and, and families here, we, we uh, went to Indian Creek Youth Camp, and I'm uh, going to share a few pictures with you, and, and hopefully you'll be able to see those on the screen as well. Uh, I want to thank you once again. I know I talked a little bit about it last week before the opening prayer, but thank you for supporting Indian Creek Youth Camp. Uh, we had a wonderful time with 190 people, and as you can see, uh, we, we had a great experience and we were involved in so many different ways. Uh, opportunities for our youth to lead singing. Um, both Daniel and I uh, got to speak uh, at camp. Uh, we, we had uh, some great uh, memories made. Of course, one of those is Joshua breaking his leg. But uh, you can see here he did get to participate in the water balloon fight. So uh, that was a plus. Um, very proud uh, of Kayla and Boo uh, for the awards they, they won at camp. Um, we're not surprised, though. We, we know we've got some special youth. Um, Addie was one of our Bible class teachers. Uh, it, it was just a great week, and we're already th thinking about next year. Um, so th thank you once again for your support and praying for the success uh, of Indian Creek Youth Camp. I think we're all rested up now from it. I think we're almost there. Um, on the screen, you, you, you see, uh, I guess this is a considered a meme or just a graphic uh, that maybe steps on your toes a little bit. I hope it does. It steps on my toes. Um, we've all been guilty of putting our foot in our mouth, or maybe even as this says, putting both feet in your mouth. I'm sure you can think back on instances and you think, why in the world did I say that? Uh, that happens to me frequently. Um, we've all been guilty uh, of saying things that we shouldn't have. We've all been guilty of regretting uh, the word choices uh, that we've used. And so what I want to challenge you today is to think about how can you do better with the words that you say, but also how can you do better with the words that you hear? And that's the point of this lesson. Uh, turn with me to 2 Chronicles 10, 1 through 19. And this was actually a story that we studied in the teen class not too long ago. Uh, we actually just wrapped up Wednesday night a three-month study on controlling our words and listening to words. Uh, I probably enjoyed it more than our teens did. Uh, but it's been my favorite study so far. We studied a new, started a new study today. Um, but a, a few weeks ago, we looked at a, a story in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 19. And I want you to notice as I read this that there's some opportunities missed by King Rehoboam. An opportunity to speak kindly and an opportunity that he missed to listen to the counsel of others. So I'm going to read this to you, 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verses 1 through 19. Then Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him a king. And where Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard about it, for he was in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon's presence. Jeroboam returned from Egypt. 
So they summoned him. Then Jeroboam and all of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam. Your father made our yoke harsh. Therefore, lighten your father's harsh service and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Rehoboam re replied, return to me in three days. So the people left. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had attended his father Solomon when he was alive, asking, how do you advise me to respond to the people? They replied, if you will be kind to this people and please them by speaking kind words to them, they will be your servants forever. Notice these next three words in verse 8. But he rejected the advice of the elders who had advised him, and he consulted with the young men who he had grown up with and, and the ones attending him. He asked them, what message do you advise we send back to the people who said to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him told him, this is what you should say to the people. Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. This is what you should say to them. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Now, therefore, my father burdened you with a heavy yoke, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplines you with whips, but I will with barbed whips. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, just as the king had ordered, saying, return to me on the third day. Then the king answered them harshly. King Rehoboam rejected the elders' advice and spoke to them according to the young men's advice, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to it. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will with barbed whips. Then the king did not listen to the people, because the turn of events came from God, in order that the Lord might carry out his word that he had spoken through Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam son of Nebat. When all Israel saw that the king had not listened to them, the people answered the king, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Israel, each of your tent. David, look after your own house now. So all Israel went to their tents. But as for the Israelites living in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam set Hadarim, who was in charge of the forced labor, but the Israelites stoned him to death. However, King Rehoboam managed to get into his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. Israel is in rebellion, in rebellion against the house of David until today. So I, I know that was a, a long reading, but I hope that you noticed some things in there on how uh, Rehoboam really failed in, in those two opportunities he had to speak kindly and to listen to the counsel, to the advice of the right people. So again, I want to pose these questions to you. Do you listen to the words of others? How do you respond to those words? And do you think about the words you say? Or do you find yourself guilty putting your foot in your mouth or both feet in your mouth and regretting it and wanting uh, to, to wish to go back and to erase those things uh, that you said. The key is, is to think ahead and think now, not in the heat of the moment, because that's where the disaster uh, begins. So let's consider just a little bit about listening to the words of others. Believe it or not, I was a teenager once. And you know how teenagers are sometimes. They think they know everything. I remember thinking that I knew everything. And I remember thinking, my parents are out of touch. They don't know anything. I know better. You know, that's just common for teenagers. But teenagers, your parents do know some things. Your parents are not experts but they've experienced some things. We all have people in our lives that we look up to, whether it be the elders in the church or a family member or someone at work. We know we can rely on their counsel and their advice. Doesn't necessarily mean they're right all the time. And age does not necessarily mean wisdom. 
but we all have people we can rely on. Make sure you're thinking about the people you get advice from. Rehoboam didn't. He did make the effort to think and, and go to uh, the elders that had helped his father in the past. But you remember those three words? But he rejected. And instead, he went to his, his buddies, his friends, and got the advice from them. And unfortunately, decided, oh, that's the advice I'm going to follow. You see, he did not listen to the right people. He chose the wrong people. We've got to be very careful in thinking about who we get our counsel from. Don't believe everything out there on the internet. Don't believe everything that you hear from other people. Don't believe everything that I'm saying right now. I'm good at making mistakes. Check God's word as we go through this lesson as well. Also, a key ingredient that comes to listening is empathy. Christ was a perfect example of empathy. And I love looking back at the way that he approached people when he talked to people about uh, their sins. He wasn't blunt. He wasn't in their face. He wasn't highly critical. He still called them out, but you can see it was in a loving way. I mean, think about uh, the woman at the well and how Christ dealt with her and the adulterous woman. Again, he wasn't blunt, but he connected with them uh, with the, the, the words that he, he used. And I know that's more about selecting the words we talk about. But my point being, Christ was empathetic and he listened to them and understood them and realized where they came from. We need to consider these things when we listen to the words of others. Notice this word from Proverbs, or this scripture from Proverbs. And Proverbs is full uh, of great little tidbits on how we can be better uh, with listening. Like Proverbs 12, 15. A fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to counsel is wise. It's so easy to think sometimes that I'm right and everybody else is wrong. But that's where we have a hardened heart. Sometimes we need to ease up. We need to think, you know what? Maybe I'm not right here. Maybe I need to think what others are saying to me. Maybe I need to look a little bit better in God's word and make sure I completely understand what's going on. Don't be wise in your own eyes. And don't uh, puff yourself up and get conceited and think that you know everything. You don't. None of us do. All of us are still learning. All of us are still trying to understand. All of us are still trying to grow. Be careful and not get so puffed up to think that you're right and everybody else is wrong. The other thing to consider from this passage is the speaking words to others. Are you harsh with your words? Do you fuel the fire? And do you select good and graceful and compassionate and empathetic words? I tried to learn this as a teacher, especially my last few years. Uh, I, I started to notice that it was getting easier to get into arguments with students. I'm not sure what had changed, but I caught myself thinking, why am I getting engaged into an argument with a student? And I remember we would have professional development and talk about different strategies to use. And obviously, when a student's yelling at you, yelling back is probably not the best strategy, at least from my experience. But one strategy I was told to use, and I tried, and it, it was effective in most cases, is simply whispering back. You might think, well, that's weird, but it worked especially when I was in the computer lab and students were up out of their seat and, or they're on inappropriate websites. So I'll just come by and say, hey, I need you to get back on task. Or if they're yelling at me because I corrected them on something, I'll just say, hey, let's just get back to work and move on. Sometimes that would surprisingly work. But I know if I yelled back, what would happen? 
we'd have a yelling match and nothing would be solved. Or even another strategy I was given as a teacher, and, and at first it was really one I didn't like, but I, I think it's effective as well. Having the, the second to last word in a conversation. What that basically means when you're having a heated discussion, don't try to end by you having the last word. Have the second to last word because if both of you are trying to have a last word, it's just going to keep going on and on. Be the person that ends it. It's not getting anywhere. And, and those ideas I've just thrown at you are some ideas that help us avoid fueling the fire when it comes to our words. Because if we're harsh with our words and people are harsh back, it just t turns into this huge, huge fire that's out of control. There's a verse that uh, I thought about with this that uh, is sp specifically talking about gossip, but I believe we can apply it to with using harsh words. Proverbs 26, 20 says, without wood, fire goes out. Without gossip, conflict dies down. Cut off the, the source of the problem when it comes with our words. Maybe the source is ourselves. Maybe the source is others, and we need to uh, avoid those situations that we find ourselves in uh, with using harsh words. But one thing I definitely want to challenge you with is don't be the person that's the problem with harsh words. This might sound controversial, but I think it's true. There are times that Christians are the worst with their words, and it hurts. I hope you aren't part of that problem. I hope that you're part of the solution. Be someone that is kind and graceful and gentle with their words. Going back to 2 Chronicles chapter 10, you see that the elders that he first consulted with, and this was in verse... Uh, verse 7, where they said, If you will be kind to this people and please them by speaking kind words to them, they will be your servants forever. Something special about kind words is just truly motivating. And I've experienced that here. My family has experienced that here. There have been several of you that have said, Oh, I'm so glad you're here. or I'm so glad uh, that you're teaching my child. And uh, you're just an encouragement to me. That, that helps me. That helps me uh, to do better, to hear that encouragement. Kind words is a spark that sometimes people need. And kind words to others can and often are life-changing. Be a part of that with your words. Change someone's life with a kind word. Don't change someone's life with a harsh word. So to wrap up this lesson and thinking about how Rehoboam, he missed the opportunity to speak kindly to the people. He missed the opportunity to accept the counsel of the right people and reject the counsel of the wrong people. Because of those mistakes, it just led to more problems. We might get away with abusing our words or ignoring the right uh, counsel. We might get away with it for a little while. We might think, ooh, I'm on the right path. I was right. I know what I'm doing. I don't need God or I don't need the advice of others. Well, did you notice what happened uh, at the end uh, of this reading? King Rehoboam was trying to get the people under control, and he had sent... Uh, that, that servant in charge of forced labor, and he was stoned to death. But then the people revolted, and Rehoboam had to, plea, to flee. He lost everything. And I believe we can confidently say it was because of the way he acted with his words and rejecting the counsel of others. Neglecting our speaking and our listening skills and not doing those things with a true purpose, that leads to problems. So I want to encourage you 
uh, not just today, but uh, the, the next week, the next month, the next year. Try to improve with the words that you say. Try to improve with listening and hearing the words of others. We all know this expression that um, will be on the There it is. Hindsight is twenty twenty. We can all look back and think, wow, why did I make that mistake? Uh, there's one I think about uh, with using the wrong words. Um, I don't think I've told this story before, but uh, when I was in high school in 10th grade, I had a biology class. It was a tough class. And I remember no matter how hard I tried, I always got like an 88 on my test or an 89. I never got that A because that, that's what I always strived for. The teacher I had was strict and uh, very organized. And I had just come from a, another teacher. At the beginning of the year, I had the fun biology teacher. Then they had to restructure some classes, and I was one of the few that got moved to her teacher, so, to her class. So I was already disappointed, but I just remember getting so frustrated with this teacher. So what did I do? I wrote an anonymous letter and sent it to her. It's embarrassing to say that right now, especially as a teacher myself. So I mailed this letter to her. I guess that gave me a sense of relief that I could express myself in that cowardly way. But yep, guess what? She figured it out. It was me. And I remember after class one day, she said, hey, Paul, can I talk to you? And we went back to a room where all the science supplies were. And as we went back there, I could see that letter in her hand. And a, a, a sense of shame just immediately hit me. And I could even feel some tears starting to get into my eyes. And she said, Paul, did you write this? And I couldn't even respond because I was just so embarrassed. Still a little embarrassed today, too, that I did this. But, and she said, well, why did you write such a thing? And then she looked at me and she said, you know what, Paul, I don't think you meant this. I'm just going to throw, throw it away. Let's never talk about this again. You think I was nice to that teacher for the rest of the year? You bet. The way that she handled that has left an impression on me to this day, obviously, that I'm talking about. She could have used it as an opportunity to embarrass me. She could have used it as an opportunity to uh, tell my parents, and then I'd have to be uh, punished in that way and be embarrassed further. Instead, um, she used it as an opportunity to be positive with her communication, which I didn't deserve. And now I look back and think, why did I do that? But wow, what a great example of someone being kind in return when I didn't deserve it. I think that teacher's still alive today, and um, I think I was able to communicate with her uh, through Facebook not too long ago. Uh, but we all have stories where we, we've said things we regretted, we wish it turned out differently. Let's try to avoid not making more embarrassing moments uh, like the one I just mentioned. So again, I challenge you to think about uh, the words that you say and think about the words that you hear. Uh, this is clearly something everyone needs to work on, and I'm preaching to myself as well. Thank you for, for listening and thinking about these things with me and, and studying these things. Um, we have an opportunity at this moment where, uh, and I know this is one of our traditions where uh, we offer an invitation. And it, it's, it's not a walk of shame. It, it's really a walk of celebration because if you're ready to repent and turn your life around or you need prayers for strength or just need a, a hug and some love from us, uh, we're here. Um, but I also know that there's interest um, from even some of our, our visitors today on what are the next steps in becoming a, a, a Christian. And I know there's interest out there about what baptism is all about. Daniel had a great lesson not too long ago where he talked about baptism and the value of that. But we know uh, that baptism is very, very important for us when we commit ourselves to Christ. And, and it's, it's so necessary. Listen uh, as I read 1 Peter three eighteen through 21. 
For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the past were disobedient. When God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in it a few, that is, eight people, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, I like how the author there connects the, the salvation of water from Noah and the ark, and now we see water saves us um, with uh, baptism. So uh, there's that important thought I just wanted to share with you for those that I know are thinking about, okay, what are my next steps? We'd love to talk to you more about that if you're interested. But at this time, if you have a need of any kind, we're here for you and we love you. Come forward now as we stand and sing.